Amen. Praise God. I want you to take your Bibles this morning and be in Matthew chapter number 13. Matthew chapter number 13. As we come to the parable contained in this text, our Lord is once again, He's delivering a clear message with a stern warning to the hearers. And in this brief story, uh, we find that it's rich in truth. It's rich in truth. And I'll tell you, one of the things, like the Lord Jesus Christ, and we worship Him and we love Him, is His Holy Word. You understand the Bible you hold in your hand is a living book. It is a living book, and it will meet your need. And every time you read it, while the text is the same, God will take that text and he will apply it to the need of your life where you are and your situation and your story right then on the spot. Well, look at Matthew 13, and let's look in verse number 31 that says this, And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs. And we learned last week it is powerful. Mustard is powerful. And becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now remember, all these parables in Matthew chapter 13 are a part of one message the Lord Jesus was giving. Each of these parables is contained in a single message sermon. And the Lord Jesus interpreted the first two parables for us, and he did so so that that could serve as a guide in how that we would be able to then properly interpret these other parables. So the parable before us this morning is the first in the series of parables that does not have the accompanying interpretation. Now Jesus interpreted those first two, but now in this parable he doesn't tell us what it is. He doesn't tell us exactly what it means. And so it's clear what the Lord Jesus now expects us to do is to take that same principle, that same guidance, and interpret these parables that would follow the others. And I want to remind you of two important dynamics for correct Bible interpretation and Bible study. And I want you to hold your finger there, and if you want to turn, you can, or you can jot it on the back of your bulletin. But I want you to listen to what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. He said this, study to show thyself approved unto God. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now notice that expression, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. In other words, there's the word of God that we're to rightly divide, but there's a bunch of babblings going on, unfortunately, in the church or in churches. And what is that going to lead to? It's not going to help you in your spiritual walk, but it's going to lead to more ungodliness in your life. And it goes on in verse 17. And their word, their, notice it's their word, not God's word, will eat as doth a, can, a canker of whom is Hamenius and Philtus. One of the things I love about the Apostle Paul in the Bible, it calls names. You know, today we've got to be politically correct and we don't name names or we don't want to offend anybody, but I'll guarantee you Paul didn't care about that. He called it the way it was. He's going to tell you the truth and the truth will set you free. He goes on in verse 18. Hey, Minius and Philtus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection, this is how they erred, saying the resurrection is past already, and what they did is overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Amen? It doesn't matter what the ignoramuses out there are doing in the name of God or with the word of God. The word of God, the true word of God, still stands sure, having this seal. And here's what he says in verse 19. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Amen. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity or sin. 
We call it a lot of things in this world, but it's very seldom called sin anymore. But it, that's exactly what it is in the eyes of Almighty God. And he goes on to describe how that in a great house, verse 20, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, that's those that are doing the work of Christ, but there's also vessels of wood and of earth, and some to honor, but some to dishonor. So what do we find in Paul's instructions to Timothy on how to interpret the Word of God? Well, number one, it's always Scripture to interpret Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. In other words, if you find a doctrine, you find a passage of Scripture that you think says something, then you go and you match that against other Scriptures. And if other Scriptures contradict that, then you've made a mistake. There's been times I've read the Bible and I thought, ooh, I, I think I found something. And then when I interpret that and match that against the, the entire Word of God, guess who made the mistake? It was me. And so you always look to interpret Scripture with Scripture. You always interpret Scripture by taking the content of the Scripture and you have to apply it in the context. And I've told you before that Matthew is a, a very Jewish book. That's why it starts with the genealogy. I'm not going to repeat that. But Paul referred to this in verse number 15 of the passage I just read to you. What did he call it? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Saying that means, in contrast, there are those that are not rightly dividing the word of truth. Some are getting it right, and there's some that are getting it wrong. So in the Word of God, we never find a symbol that's used in a way that conflicts with the rest of the Word of God. And so with that in mind, what do we do? We must note that each one of these parables goes together, and each one of these parables reveals the basic same truth. Now you remember the parable of the sower and the seed, what did we find there? A false confession. Only one out of four were legit. Only one out of four. 25% the seed fell on the good ground, they were converted and served the Lord Jesus Christ. Three out of the four, something happened to the seed. Something was wrong in the situation or in their life. So we see a false confession. Then in the parable of the wheat and tares, we find there's wheat, which are the saved, and there's tares that are the unsaved. And they're sown in the field, and here's the thing. They're in the church. And we will again remember that the word, the tares were sown by the enemy among the wheat, that that literally means every other one. Now, I hope that's not the case here at Liberty. But what we find there is not only a false confession, but a false Christian. And if you'll remember from last week, we find these false confessions, they've led to fake Christians, the wheat and the tares. And so these are the people that maybe have professed salvation, but the problem is in their heart and life, they do not possess salvation. Now, as I've demonstrated before, we can say anything. I can tell you, Hey, my name is Rick Ross, and I'm a millionaire. Liar, liar, your pants are on fire. Everybody knows I'm no millionaire. <laughs> In fact, uh, I need to borrow some money from somebody today to pay for it. No, I'm teasing about that. But listen, these are, the, these are the people that say that they are saved, but their life doesn't reflect that they've ever met the Lord Jesus that I met. Listen, I've locked, walked the low way. The highway's a lot better. I lived for 26 years of my life being raised in church as a lost young man. And it was only July 1992 when God come to me and in my moment of, 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 of crisis of belief that I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ with no strings attached, no prior knowledge moving me in any direction, just I'm lost, I need Jesus. And folks, I got goosebumps right now even thinking about that moment because it was like Jesus sat right down beside me and knocked on my heart's door. And that day, that evening, that night, I opened that door in a small classroom upstairs with my pastor. So I want you to understand, 
We're talking about the seed of the word of God. And every other person that heard the gospel in the sower and the seed, every other person, they did not take the word of God for what it was. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us that because of their false confessions, they became fake Christians or false Christians. And then we learned last week in the parable of the mustard seed, which we're finishing that today, that there are those that have made a false confession and they are now false Christians and that has led to a false church or false churches. And so Paul reminds Timothy as well as you and I this morning, this thing right here, what you don't know can hurt you. Amen? And so I want you to see where we were last week. We noted, first of all, the releasing of the parable's principles. And in the parable of the mustard seed, we immediately know that the Lord Jesus Christ is giving to us some principles of this parable. And principles are things that come from truth that allow us to guide our lives, that allow us to understand that truth and apply it to the need of our life. Truth does you no good if you do not act on it, amen? I can tell you when you leave out of here, don't go uh, to the east because there's a giant hole out there and if you drive down that road, it's not marked, you're going to drive off into that hole. And some of you might, you know, some people just don't listen to the pastor for whatever reason, I don't know why. They're going to go that direction. And we're going to have to call 911 because they're going to be in a pit. The others that listen are going to go the west. And they're going to avoid that pitfall. Well, so it is right here with these principles. And notice, first of all, how that Jesus gives us this powerful metaphor in verse number 31. Matthew 13 and verse 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Now I want to call your attention to a particular phrase there. The kingdom of heaven. Now understand what this phrase means right here. You must remember the purpose of the parables. What's going on here? Why did the Lord Jesus give these parables? Not just the first one, not just the second one, but every single one of them. It's because they are all describing an aspect of the kingdom. So remember the phrase, the kingdom of God. When the Lord Jesus was preaching right here, the context there... The parables must be all viewed in the same context, okay? Now, I told you last Sunday morning, the word kingdom, oftentimes, it suggests a place. And I demonstrated that by saying maybe like the magic kingdom at Disney, the kingdom. But that's not what he's talking about right here. The word right here does not describe a place, but rather it describes the state of affairs in the world. In other words, what's going on in the world? I think every one of us, if we were honest and if we're informed, and, and we, me and Brother John were talking after I picked him up, he, was, he sent me a meme the other day and he said, did you understand what that's talking about? I, and I said, yeah, absolutely. I knew exactly what you're talking about. I knew exactly what it connected to. Because why? I, need, I have to stay informed as a pastor in order to help you in the life you're living, amen? Because we all are living in the world. We're not of the world, but we live in this world. Amen. And so as uh, Dr. Jerry Thorpe many years ago, he said, you want to be a good pastor, a good preacher of the word, you carry a Bible in one hand and Rolling Stone magazine in the other. <laughs> I thought, how foolish is that? But what he was saying is, you've got the word of God, but then you've got to know what's going on in the world in order to apply the word of God for the people. And that's good information right there. I don't subscribe to any of those magazines, but I stay informed through other means, of course, digital and electronically nowadays. So remember that phrase there. It's not talking about a place, but rather the state of affairs in the world. And specifically, he's talking about how it would be at the time that you and I are living, how it would be in our lives in the world right now today. And so he's essentially prophesying in these uh, parables about what you don't know can hurt you. And he's talking to you and I this morning. So he announced the coming of God's kingdom. When he does that, he's not talking about a theological mystery, by the way. Rather, he's telling us 
Uh, something of an enormous importance, by the way. What is that? He's telling us that in our time, the time in which we're living, that the true Christians need to take note of what's going on in our world. Understand that what we don't know can hurt us. And Jesus, in essence right here, is, is letting the people of his day know what the world's going to be like in our day. And here's what he's saying. He's talking about the time of God's final intervention in human history and what was going to happen at some point in that day. In other words, we're living today. And it's difficult for us in our minds to comprehend that tomorrow is not going to be just like today is. It's hard for us to comprehend that next week is not going to be just like last week was. It's hard for us to comprehend that one of these days, the trumpet's going to sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain that know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior will be caught up and taken out of this world in the rapture, and then the great tribulation is going to happen, and Antichrist is going to appear, and there's going to be, Jesus said in Matthew 24, it's going to be so bad, there's never been any crisis like the great tribulation in the history of the world. Not the flood, not the earthquakes, not the, the rulers that were burning Christians in their garden parties like Nero. None of that compares to what's going to happen in the Great Tribulation. So what was this? This was a divine revelation of a divine revolution that the Lord Jesus Christ himself is going to lead in the end times. Amen? And I say, let's get it started today, Lord. Amen? So what a powerful metaphor we see. But notice not only this powerful metaphor, but a precise method. Look again in verse 31. The kingdom of heaven is likened, notice that, likened to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. So he's using this mustard seed, and he says, what's going to happen at the end times is like what a, a mustard seed does. So, so understand this. You see, there's a principle contained in this parable, and it's also contained in the other two parables. It's something that involves the Lord Jesus Christ himself in one, and it's something that involves you and I in the other two. So under, understand, in, in the second parable, the sower was the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. In the first and third parable, who, who is, is the, the, the object there? Well, the sower there is you and I. And so the seed went forth in the first parable, and I'm so glad when the seed of God's word found me, amen. I'm glad the soil was fertile and it, and it found itself to, to land there, to be fertilized, to be watered, and to sprout eternal life in my soul instantly, amen. Three out of the four people that hear it, that doesn't happen. Well, the third, the third parable is also about us. We're the sower. And what are we to do? We're to do what I did Wednesday in Miss uh, Margaret Nelson's funeral service. And Brother Nelson got it right. Uh, you know, in what would you like me to do? How do you, he said, preach the, preach the gospel. Hey, man, you tell me to do that, I'll do that anywhere, anytime. On any housetop or any mountaintop. Amen? So we're the ones that are to go forth into the fields in this third parable and do what? Share the seed of the Word of God with those around us. Now, as I said last week, we're not responsible for the seed. Amen? The seed is the Word of God, and that's God's part. And by the way, the seed, the Word of God, is settled, it's finished, and that's why so many people are trying to pervert it today by changing the Word of God. I'll tell you what, I, I, just, I stick to the old, old book, and you know what? Like I said, if you can't understand being thou, you're not going to understand you and y'all. Amen? It's not difficult. It's not hard. Listen, so we're not responsible for the harvest either. We plant the seed of God's word, but we're not responsible for the harvest. That also is the work of God and the power of the Holy Spirit as he takes the word of God, plants it into the heart and mind of a, an individual, and then they act. So it's not my responsibility to harvest, it's your responsibility to act and God gives the harvest. So it's a work, listen, uh, oftentimes when we take the word of God, understand this morning, 
We are responsible for taking the word of God. Why? Because there's lost men and women, boys and girls that need Jesus. Amen? They need to know that name that is above every name. You know why? Because every single soul that exists, they'll either bow unto the Lord Jesus and to pronounce him as Lord and Savior right now, or they'll do it in eternity when it's too late. I say, let's get it done now. That's why we go pick up little kids. That's why we go pick up folks in a church band. That's why we do whatever we can do to plant the seed of the Word of God. Listen, it's, it's, it's not a work done for us, but it's a work that needs to be done by us. It's our responsibility. He says it in verse 31, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. So here's the thing. If you never sowed the seed of the gospel that Jesus saves, that's it. Simply, Jesus saves. And you don't have to know a lot of Bible to tell somebody else what Jesus did in your life. Amen? They, they might can argue doctrine, but they can't argue a changed life. They might can argue a passage of scripture, but they can't argue a man that was once a meth addict and is now a, a Christ follower. They can argue a Bible scripture, but they can't understand why it is that an, a man that was an alcoholic, a drunk, an abusive person that God changed him and now he's a family man that loves his family and takes his family to church and is a faithful father, amen? They can argue all these other things, but they can't argue that. Listen, we understand the seed of the gospel that Jesus saves. If we don't sow it, friend, we can't expect the harvest. Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, And Jesus came and spake unto them, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. So we see that God, pray for me, my voice last night and today has been bugging me a little bit, and I want to preach. Amen. I don't want to talk, I want to preach. John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said, Peace be unto you, and as the Father hath sent me, so send I you. So the Lord Jesus, what does he do? He gives us some principles contained in this powerful metaphor showing us there's a precise method that we are to use for his glory. So notice the second thing, the rending, rendering of the parables pictures. Not only the releasing of the parables principles, but the rendering of the parables pictures. In fact, there are some unique qualities that we find about the seed that the Lord used to demonstrate this vivid picture for us. What is he speaking of here? I'll tell you, he's not speaking of some severe meteorological event or some financial collapse or some political upheaval. He is talking about a time when the trumpet will sound and the church, the bride of Christ, will be taken out of here. And listen, men and women and those young people that have come to the age of accountability, they will be left behind to ultimately be sentenced to a place called hell where they'll burn in fire for all eternity. Now, folks, that's not pleasant. I take no joy in saying it, but it's the truth of God's word. I want you to listen to something. In fact, if you have time, turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to begin reading, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. I want you to listen to this because people go, oh, you talk about hell and a hellfire preacher. Amen. I saw a guy wearing a shirt that said the Hellfire Club. And it had a, had a devil's head on it. And I, I want to make one that says the Hellfire Preaching Club, and it's got a devil face on it with a black eye and a bloody nose and beat, beat up. Amen? So I raised on <laughs> Hellfire Preaching. You know what? There's old-time preachers. When the Great Awakenings happened, people were so convicted by the Word of God that they literally clinged to the pillars in the church thinking they were literally going to fall into hell in any moment. Listen to what Peter says in his second epistle, chapter 3, verse 1. The second epistle, <clears throat> beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up, stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the, our Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Who are the scoffers? The scoffers are the mockers. Let me tell you, let me give you an example of a scoffer, and I don't want to get political here, but she asked for it. 
The other day, when in a, a, a political meeting, somebody says, Jesus is king, and she goes, ha, 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 with that laugh. Well, you're in the wrong meeting. You're in the wrong place. They were in the, in, the, in the wrong place in the sense of their political ideologies, but they were in the right place to tell people that Jesus is Lord. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of things I don't agree with Trump about. His lifestyle, things he's done, things he said, I don't like, but I'll tell you this. He said, it doesn't matter who's the president, Jesus is still king. And I'll respect that every day, amen? So notice what's going on here. The saying, these scoffers, what are they doing? It says in verse 3, they're walking after their own lust. They're walking around going, yeah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Where is it? I don't see it. You will one day, my friend. You will one day. Here's what he says. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since our fathers, verse 4, fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. It, it, they're actually kind of smart here because it goes back the first promise of Jesus coming, a Messiah, a Savior, is right after the fall of Adam and Eve. And in Genesis 3.15, God gives a prophetic uh, message that God's still in control and that God is going to redeem lost mankind by sending a Messiah, a Savior, a Redeemer. So where's, this, where's the promise of His coming? For since our fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Talking about Noah there. <clears throat> but the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store. You know what that means? God, God had, we, now we had some terrible floods and my, we're still praying for those folks. That was bad. And we, we love them. We're helping. We're praying. But he's, ta he's not talking about another flood that destroys the earth because he said I'm, that's what the rainbow is. Rainbow don't uh, mean the LGBTQ, ABCD, EFG, Z people or whatever that means. The rainbow means God's promise he'll never destroy this earth again with water. But notice what he says. He says in verse 7, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store. God's waiting, reserved for what? Unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. What he's saying there is, it might, not seem, it might seem like it's been a long time since all this was written, that it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And he goes on, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, verse number 9, but is long-suffering to us, word. He's long-suffering, that's why he's waiting, so that everyone can be saved, possibly, possibly will. He's long-suffering to us, word, and he's not willing. In other words, his heart is not that anyone goes to hell. God doesn't want that, God loves you. He's long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come, verse 10, as a thief in the night, into which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate you. Get out of this Diet Dr. Pepper that I love so much, but it doesn't help my voice very much. They're going to melt. They'll be burned up. Seeing then, verse 11, that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Knowing this is coming, how are we to live? Listen. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in him in peace, without spot and blameless. In other words, we live holy lives according to the word of God. And account that the long-suffering our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. 
Peter identifies it right there. See, Peter's just a down-to-earth, you know, plain old Jane old guy. He was a fisherman, converted. So he doesn't have the theological training that the Apostle Paul had. He wasn't schooled at the school uh, of, of Gamaliel. He didn't have that, that proper uh, learning in the things of the Scripture. And so Paul talked in some ways that are hard to understand. Read the book of Hebrews. Paul, I believe, is the writer, and it's sometimes hard to understand some of those things. But he goes on, which they are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware ye also, now notice this, lest ye also, being led away with error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. In other words, all the craziness going on in the world and the numbskull preachers out there preaching messages that are not contained in the Word of God, you got to be careful what you listen to or you can err from the faith. They can cause you not, you don't lose your salvation, amen. We're wholly sealed by the Spirit of God, amen. You don't lose that. But I'll tell you what, you can lose your rewards in heaven. I'll tell you what, you can, you can lose your life. Talk about Ananias and Sapphira that lied to the Holy Spirit and God struck them down at the doorstep of the church. Your life can get so bad, God says, you know what? I'm not going to let you destroy other Christians. Bam, come on home, and you're in heaven. Yet so as by fire, the Bible says. But he says in verse 18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. So notice what the Lord, that's a long scripture, and I want to explain some of it. But notice what the Lord does next. He describes the size of this mustard seed. He says in verse 32, which is indeed the least of all the seeds. Now notice, this was the smallest seed, and I told you last week in Israel, okay? That's what's important. And by using the mustard seed to represent the gospel message, the Lord Jesus is emphasizing that how something so simple and so basic can land in our heart and change us. Amen? Do you remember that day when you were born again? Do you remember that time? You know what, it's good to go back to that day when Jesus saved you from a life of failure and misery and destruction and fear and doubt and saved you. Listen, our lives are not perfect. We live in a broken world. We ourselves, our flesh is still broken. Our spirit and our soul are saved, but our flesh is not saved yet, amen? And if we're not careful, this old flesh can drag us in to do some bad things. doesn't mean we're not saved. It means we might be... a, a not very smart because the low way is bad, the highway is good, amen? It's sad to say, but in many churches, they become so commercialized and so culturalized that they overlook the significance of something as simple as the preaching of the Word of God. And let me tell you, I've been to preacher school. I can run over the, well, no, I, I, I might fall if I try to run. But, you know, I can walk over here and make these big things and, and swell my words and I can do the hoop and I can do all these things. But, folks, that doesn't do anything except bring glory and, and, and the spotlight on me. Listen, I'm to deflect all of that. All glory goes to God and I simply give the word of God. Some of the greatest preachers that ever lived read their messages. They looked down in a dimly lit by candlelight their sermon and read it. So it's not about me, it's about the Lord Jesus. You know what, they, these churches today, so many of them don't, and I don't know, I don't know if they do it maliciously or ignorantly or foolishly, but they do everything under the sun except give the word of God. What's going to break the stony heart, the word of God? Brother Wade mentioned it about the, the Word of God. Listen, you will either be broken on the stone of the Word of God or that stone will fall on you and crush you one day. You'll either yield to it now and be a broken man and let God heal you and make you what He wants you to be or that stone will crush you in eternity. So what does he describe here? The size of the seed, this little bitty mustard seed. But then he depicts the significance of the seed, verse 32. He goes on to say, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but notice this expression, but when it is grown, look in your Bible. But when it is grown, 
<clears throat> while it starts out as a seed, what's awesome about this, because most of our planting now, if we're not farmers, and, we, and if we don't have a garden, we don't plant seeds. We, we might go to Smith's Garden Town, <clears throat> and we buy small plants. And those small plants or, or shrubs might grow big. I got two huge red oak trees in my front yard that I planted as little sticks. I got them as little sticks. I had to, in fact, put a, a bar and a thing to keep them from falling over when the wind came. They were just on a ball, the root ball. So we understand that, but not a lot of us understand the significance of planting a seed. While it starts out a seed, notice it doesn't remain a seed. Because after it's planted, what happens? It's watered. And then it's fertilized. And then it's nurtured. It's nurtured and it's pruned. By the way, that's what God does in our life. You know what? Some pruning is not always fun, is it? But you know what? Sometimes God's got to prune some things out of your life to make you able to grow to be what he wants you to be. Amen? And so then it begins to sprout, and it, and it grows. And the mustard seed grows into a lovely mustard plant. So our Lord reminds us, be not deceived by the size of this seed, which in this case is the word of God, because why? It carries great significance. Notice the second, a, a third thing. It declares the strength of the seed. He describes the size. He depicts the significance. Now he declares the strength in verse 32. He goes on to say about the seed, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown... It is the greatest among the herbs. Now, he makes a specific thing there. It's the greatest among the herbs, okay? So note that. You see, while the seed may be small in size, when it's planted, it, it becomes something of great significance. And in the herb world, and I'm not an herbal, herbalologist or whatever they call those folks, uh, I bought my wife this planter thing that had like three rows of these things and and I planted, and she grew different herbs in every one of them and stuff. And I didn't know all of them. They were pretty. I didn't even know what they were really for, uh, except, some, you know, some rosemary maybe or uh, what was the other? Mint, mint, you know. Mint is good, by the way. You plant it around your house, it keeps mosquitoes away. They don't like mint for some reason. But we like mint. We chew mint gum, right? Remember the double mint twins? They give you fresh breath, Amen. I'm telling you right now, some of you teenage boys need to try it, you know, amen? Listen, it becomes something of great strength. Listen to what, listen to what Paul said in Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, amen? To everyone that believeth, first the Jew and also the Greek, amen? The Jew, God chose the people. The Greek, we're, we fall in that category. We're Gentiles. If you're not Jewish, you're Gentile. So praise God for that. We're included. We're grafted in. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to uh, piercing even the dividing asunder and spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. You know what the word of God does when this book goes forth right there here this morning and we rightly divide the word of truth? It goes right to your heart. And having been the recipient of it, sometimes... This book goes, bam, right to your head and go, wake up. You're doing some foolish things. It's wrong. God don't like it, and God's not going to bless it. Amen? See, a lot of people live their lives however they want, and they think God's going to bless them just because they're a Christian. No, God won't bless a mess. God blesses his divine plan, whether it's being in marriage or parenting or living the Christian life. God has a plan. That's the only plan he blesses. Amen? Just because you say, I'm a Christian, doesn't mean God's going to bless you. You can be a, you can be a, a, a dad that uh, reads the Bible to his kids and prays, and then you can be a thief that steals from God every Sunday when you don't give your tithes and offerings. You know what? God won't bless that. But if you're faithful in that area, God says, you know what? I'm going to bless you so much. I'm going to give... Uh, it's going to be pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Show me and give to your bosom. And not only that, I'm going to rebuke the devil on your behalf. Hallelujah for that. So if the devil's knocking on your door and kicking your tail all the time, maybe you might want to say, uh, God, I need you to rebuke him for me. And God might come back and say, how's your giving? You know what? I, I told you last week, I don't know who gives. I, don't know, I, don't, I can't even tell you what the offering was last week. I don't care. My job is not to... Fill these pews, my job is to fill this pulpit. My job is not to fill the coffers, my job is to fill this pulpit, amen? 
and that's what I do. Peter said that we're born not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So I got to get to this last point this morning. So we see the releasing of the principles of the parable or the parable's principles. Then the rendering of the parable's pictures. Now we understand the picture, a small seed, and what it can become. It's, it's an herb that is pungent. And I told you the funny story about how the time my wife, when we were first married 32 years ago, made mustard gas out of some mustard in a pan trying to make German mashed potatoes, and we had to evacuate the place. It can be pungent. You know what? You get a little mayonnaise, okay. You get mustard, mustard on a hot dog from QT over there right now sounds so good. We drove by there today, and man, me and my wife are traveling. We'll stop in there. I'll get about four of those hot dogs and a Diet Dr. Pepper, and she's got whatever she gets, and while I'm driving, she's feeding me hot dogs, and I'm just driving down the road with mustard. I'm loving it, amen? So now we move to the revealing of the problems. You remember in each one of these parables, there's been a problem, hasn't there been? And so this is the thrust of everything the Lord Jesus has been saying in these parables. In fact, at, when you first look, this is something that we may not notice unless we dig deeper. Because if we just continue on with the same process here, the same thing, with the same thought process in mind, we can come to a conclusion that is wrong about this parable. Now, you remember the problem with the parable of the sower and the seed. What was the problem? The word of God went forth, only one out of four accepted it. That's a problem, amen? Right now, I'm preaching, and if we were to apply one out of four takes the word, applies it to their life, and goes out changed. While that is good that that happened for one and four, that's bad. That's bad statistically. Amen? So what do we see right here? The sower and the seed. It's important that we allow ourselves to take the seed of God's word and apply it to the need of our life. Amen? Then we saw the parable of the wheat and the tares. What was the problem there? There was a great harvest. And, but the problem was the, the workers went out there who obviously helped the, the master of the field and said, where did you get that seed? Wasn't that seed we planted good seed? And, of course, the analogy there is the word of God, amen? And the word of God is good, amen? The psalmist said that it was like honey in the honeycomb, amen? It's wonderful problem is he said he said yeah we planted good seed but an enemy who's the enemy the devil satan the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat amen so we see two problems we see number one that there's a lot of people going in at the broad way because narrow is the the way and straight is the gate that leadeth to life everlasting and few there be that find it because broad is the, the way and, and, and broad is the gate that leads to destruction and many are going that way. Three out of the four are going that way. Well then there's tares among the wheat. Well what do we do? Do we go uh, find out who's a tear and pull them up out of the church? No. Why? Because it might be a husband is a wheat and a wife is a tear. Husbands are going, yeah, my wife's a holy tear, right? And I'm not talking about that. It's something different. No, what, what would happen if we identified in the church, if we could do that, because everybody's a Christian, right, nowadays? I'm a Christian. And three minutes later, they're cussing like a sailor, you know. If we did that, there's going to be some collateral damage. Some people are going to be uprooted. I thought they were Christians. That was my wife, that was my husband, that was my kid, that was my mom, that was my dad, that was my... And they weren't. And if they're rooted up now, it could literally destroy the harvest of the wheat. He said, just wait, it'll all be taken care of in the end, and the wheat will be gathered into my barn, heaven, and unfortunately the tares will be bound and burned. I gave you the illustration about how wheat, there's fruit inside wheat, but a tear that looks like wheat, there's nothing in it. It's empty. So notice what's going on here. We see here yet another parable 
that has a problem being revealed. Notice what the problem is in verse 32. First of all, there's unnatural growth. You go, unnatural growth? Follow with me here. Verse 32, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, is the greatest among herbs. True. Notice this part, though. It becometh a tree. Now, the Lord Jesus described the size of the seed, the significance of the seed, and he described the strength of the seed, and then he moved to reveal the problems. What is it? Unnatural growth. When he says it becomes a tree. Now, a lot of Bible scholars wrongly, falsely say, well, that's just a sign that, you know what, the seed goes forth and, and, and you know, it becomes this wonderful, magnificent thing. But the problem is people that say that don't know anything about mustard seed. And they don't know anything about mustard plants. Mustard, have you ever seen a mustard tree? Why? They don't exist. Mustard seeds don't become a tree. Mustard seeds at the best become a small little shrub. But notice, notice what appears to be a reference to the seed growing into a tree. The point that Jesus is making here is to make us aware lest we be deceived into thinking that a tree can be the result of mustard seed. What's being represented here, we've talked about a false confession that led to fake Christians, and now we see a false and fake church. Now, now track with me here. It was not planted as mustard seed. It was planted as a tree seed all along. And just as the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, we now find the problem and the problem is mustard seed does not become a tree. So something has happened, something has transpired here. So what's the meaning of this? What's the normal result that you can expect of the gospel when it goes forth into the human heart and someone's saved? What kind of character does the word of God produce? Well, I tell you what, it destroys pride. It destroys egotistical uh, behavior. It destroys self-centeredness. It, it, it renders a person humble and lowly of mind like the Lord Jesus. Meek and gentle towards others. And here it is. And ready and willing to serve. You know what? As pastor... I should not ever have to beg anyone to serve Jesus. I should not have to beg anyone that's a member of this church to see the need and take the lead to see that everything is taken care of at this church. Amen? And you might not have the ability to take care of it. You might not have the money to help do it. But you can come to the pastor because a lot of times I don't even know about it. I can't manage this giant facility and every single person that comes under the sound of the preaching here. There's things I don't know. I'm not a mind reader. So what do I need? I need people that are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And a sign that there's a root in your life called salvation is there is fruit that comes into your life after salvation. So notice this. The Word of God takes these things away. Amen? And l listen, none of us have arrived yet. R Amen? Paul says, I count not myself to have apprehended. In other words, I haven't crossed the finish line. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this is one thing I do. Forgetting the things that are, that are behind where I messed up and pressing forward unto that which is before, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen, hallelujah. That's what we're to do. And that's what we're to be. Yes, we mess up. That's yesterday. It's like I told that gentleman at the graveside the other day. You know what? You can't change how you started the race, but friend, you can change how you finished the race. Amen? And we might fall. But the, listen, people finish differently. The Lord illustrates that in the, in the talents, the parable of the talents, where some brought forth 100, some 60, some, you know, the, some 30. Not everybody's the same. 
I'm no super stellar saint. When I think about the heroes of the faith, I think about preachers of the last generation, the last century, and I look at my life, I think, you know what? Whatever line there might be at heaven to get anything, I'm going to be at the back of it. It doesn't mean that I walk around going, well, I shouldn't even try. No, if I fall, I get up and I continue my race. I mess up. I say, God, you said in your word in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God, I'm doing that now. God, you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should repent. I find myself having to do that a lot. Maybe not so much the things that I do outwardly, but boy, there's some stinking thinking that goes on up here. Amen? Don't you leave me hanging out here by myself. Amen? And sometimes it does reveal itself in actions. And it's not pleasing to God. And it breaks his heart. And so I confess it. And by his grace and mercy, I, I forsake it. Amen? And I don't look at yesterday, I look at tomorrow, what I can be and do for him. I might have fallen in the race, but I'm getting up and I'm running. Lord Jesus said, he that is greatest in the kingdom of heaven must become the least of all. If any would become great among you, let him become the servant of all. Mark chapter 9, verse 35. You want to know who's great in this church? The people that no one knows who they are, but they work and they serve behind the scenes all the time. I'm privileged as a pastor to see a lot of things and know a lot of things because my family pretty much lives up here at the church. And that's a good thing. But my wife, Sue, did you know sister so-and-so or brother so and I said, no, I didn't know that. I was Because I work a second job where I can have health care. I didn't know that. I wasn't there. And, and, and so, praise God. Do I make a big deal out of it? No. But they're those quiet, silent servants that keep this church going. Amen? When you find loftiness and pride, and listen to this, because this can be a good thing in certain ways, in certain contexts, but it can also be a bad thing. Ambition. Ambition. I've had, I had a, a man that was here in the church many years ago, and he, he ended up being a pretty bad troublemaker. But he'd always say, I'm called to be a pastor. Well, brother, you are not going to pastor this church because God called me to be the pastor, amen? So if God's called you to be a pastor, why don't you do what I did and quit my job making eighty-five dollars to $100,000 a year and go be a youth pastor making about $35,000 a year, run around with a bunch of knucklehead teenagers for three to five years, and then see, are you called to be a pastor? It's not, it's not all beautiful things. I'm not getting in a jet plane and driving, you know, uh, a brand new Mercedes. And God has been good to me, and I am blessed. Hallelujah. All glory to him. Amen. Ambition. Domination of others. Well, you see that in churches today. Pastors, and by the way, a lot of churches and a lot of denominations use a false doctrine that if you don't do what I say and do it how I say it, you can lose your salvation, brother. Well, that's false doctrine right there, and it's used to manipulate people into doing things like elderly folks watching the TV and said, you sow your seed of $1,000 and God's going to bless you with a million or whatever. No, you're a liar, you're of the devil. And lo the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and it has called a, caused a lot of people to err from the faith. Concern for self. Our concern as Christians ought to be for others above ourselves. Amen? Throughout the word of God, what do, we, what do we find? Here it is. A tree is always a type of worldly power and authority. Did you know that? And here's what it is. An example would be Nebuchadnezzar was given a vision of himself. Remember that? And in that vision, what did he see? He saw a tree, and that tree signifying worldly power and domination. Think about Pharaoh and Exodus. It, he... It was also symbolized as a tree. It speaks of what? Pride, haughtiness, loftiness. And, and, and think about popular churches and culture today. I mean, it's like a grand show every Sunday. And I would say this. Listen, uh, years ago before the military moved a lot of our families, before COVID, we had so many uh, people that we went to two services. We had an 830 service. By the way, I call that the dead zone. That was just the people who wanted to get it over with where they'd go eat. But uh, when, when I came, 
and, and started preaching. If I preached on Sunday, that 8.30 service and the 11 o'clock service, I didn't even preach the same message. I allowed God to lead me and I prayed, what would you have me to preach to those 8.30 guys? What would you have me to preach to? Every time I preached those two services while we were doing it, I preached different messages. You know why? I, there is not in me anything that wants this to be a showtime for Rick Ross. Well, we got showtime at 8 and we got showtime at 10 and we've even got a showtime at 1 o'clock. And it's the same message. And it looks like they're speaking extemporaneously and they're all over the place. Well, if I preached a message three times on a Sunday morning, I would have it memorized. And you go, are you being critical of some of those other churches? Honestly? By their fruits you shall know them. When, when some big mega churches that have millions in the bank quit driving buses and vans to pick up little kids over on east side like we did this morning because of the problems it creates in the church and because of the expense, yeah, I, I think they've got a problem. Jesus said, as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it for me. The unlovelies, the dirty, the stinkies. You want to smell some stinky, get on the church van on Wednesday night. I found a deal at the, at the work that's supposed to neutralize scent for hunting. I'm going to try that in the church van and see if it neutralizes the scent of kids. <laughs> Listen, Paul says in Ephesians 4 that Christ's church is to come with lowliness, gentleness, and meekness of character, not talking about itself. What did those early Christians do? They never talked about the church. They talked about Jesus Christ. I'm not... I listen, I love liberty. I'm the pastor. I've been here as the pastor for 22 years. I was raised here from the time I was 12 years old. I love this place. But you know what? When I go out there, while I'm not letting them know I'm a pastor at liberty, I'm talking about Jesus. This church isn't going to change anybody's life. This church isn't going to solve anybody's problems, but the Lord Jesus can. And so what is our Lord and Savior doing? He's warning us against becoming infatuated, hear me, with a tree... So much so that we overlook the mustard seed, which is what? The Word of God. So under, understand something right here. By the way, let me just clarify this. So, hang on, that, that, we're, all, we're almost done. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Paul writes to young Timothy. This is the second letter that he writes to him. And here's what he says. I charge thee. I charge thee, therefore, now listen to this, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Now what's the charge? When I was ordained in the ministry, I was taken in a room and questioned by the nine men that held doctorates and all that, questioned by them intensely about my knowledge of the scripture and Bible doctrine. And then an example of that, they brought me out in front of the entire church congregation, and they each asked me one of the questions that they had asked me many questions, each of them, behind closed doors. And I had to answer those questions before the church. And then those men come after Dr. Joe Patterson preached a charge to me what did he do? He was challenging me, and, and, and here's the message. He said, many before you have built, and he used the scripture that David gave his son Solomon, and thou may add us thereto. You know what I'm doing here at Liberty? I'm building where other men have sown. I'm building where Pastor Reed laid the foundation in 1977. Amen? October 16th. I didn't lay the foundation. He, with the Lord's help, laid the foundation, and I'm just adding to it by preaching the word of God. So what is he charging him to do right here? Here it is, verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering, and the what, church? Doctrine. We don't care about doctrine here. Well, you need to close the doors. 
For the time will come, and it's here, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust. What do they come? They come to church, man, I hope the preacher's got something good for me. I need 10 principles on how to, how to get my wife in line, or I got 10 principles how to get my wayward son back. And you can find those things in the Word of God. Ten principles, my wife, the wife, on how to keep from killing my husband. And you can find those things in the Word of God. But when we come after our own lust, wanting our ears tickled, and people leave going, oh, that was just so good. I got warm fuzzies and goosebumps. Now, if it's from God, hallelujah. If it's from me, shame on me. Listen, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Rep what does that mean? Reprove, rebuke with all long suffering in the doctrine. Preach it when they like it and preach it when they lump it. Preach it when they shout, amen, church? And we're going to preach it when they pout. For the time will come, they will not endure that sound doctrine. They won't stand for it. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itch and ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned into fables. But watch thou, Timothy, in all things, endure afflictions, because the time will come when you preach the word, you're going to endure affliction. When that, those young men or young ladies, whoever they were, I don't know, when they said Jesus is king, guess what? They escorted them out, threw them out of the place. When, when an when a elderly person in their 70s prays outside of an abortion clinic and they're federally charged with a hate crime, they're enduring affliction. They weren't hurting anybody. They weren't touching anybody. They were just speaking the name of Jesus. We better not take our child sacrifice away to our false gods. Watch in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. That goes back to the sowing of the seed, amen? To evangelize means to tell, give the word, give the gospel that Jesus saves. And he says, make full proof of thy ministry, amen? So Paul's commanded Timothy to preach what's already established. Amen? He says to the Corinthian church, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that are perishing foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen? So what was our mission in 1977? To reach the lost at any cost, to baptize the saved, to teach them the Bible truths, assimilate them into the church family and ministry, and then to have them repeat the cycle with us. Amen? So what is this tree in this parable? It's a counterfeit. It's a fake. It's a phony. Church. Notice this last thing, the unwelcome group, okay? So we see this unnatural growth. Now notice the unwelcome group in verse 32. And becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. If you quickly look at this, you might think, well, wow, that's a beautiful picture. And we got bird watchers and stuff. I'm not a bird watcher. I'm a bird shooter, okay? I'm like, I'm like Dr. Canner. I'm a member of PETA. People eating tasty animals. <laughs> Amen? So you might think that these birds represent a delight, and I, I'm kidding about that. I am fascinated by owls and hawks and eagles and, and birds, and especially like the cardinals. You find their mate, and, you know, it's, it's weird. The male always looks really pretty, and the female doesn't. Yeah, I don't know why that is. But what, what are the fowls of the air? In order to understand the, what these birds are a picture of, you've got to travel back to that first parable. Remember the one of the sower and the seed? Remember that? You remember in that parable in verse 4, Jesus said, Some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. And the seed in that parable was the word of God. So the fowls here are evil ones. The fowls here are the enemy, the devil. Listen, this, listen, in the, you travel through the parables of Jesus. You find time and again that the Lord would use a symbol of something to represent Something else, the same thing, though, throughout all the parables. And so what are these birds spoken of here? These are not pleasant birds. These are perilous birds. These are scavengers, vultures, buzzards. And what we have here is a picture of the devil's dirty birds. 
The false church, by the way, is symbolized by the great harlot in the city called Mystery Babylon, the great Revelation 17.5. When it is overthrown, an angel announces, listen to what the angel says in Revelation 18.2, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of demons and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of, of every unclean and hateful bird. Let me read that again. Babylon the great whore is fallen, is fallen, repeated twice, amen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of demons and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So what the Lord Jesus is doing here, he's vividly describing how the devil infiltrates the ranks of Christianity with his dirty bird with his devilish birds. What do we have? A false confession. A false confession represents a false Christian. And false Christians will come up with a false church. Let me say this, just because it says Baptist on the sign does not mean it's right. Just because it, in the pulpit someone says, you know what, I'm a Baptist or I'm a Bible believer doesn't mean they're Right, beware of the birds that lodge in the tree. And how visibly this is seen in our day in pulpits and churches all over the country with a flood of crazy, mixed up ideas, evil concepts. And you know what it does? It ruins the hearts and minds of people that are legitimately hungry and thirsty for the things of God. David said, as a deer panteth after the water brook, so my soul longs for you, Jesus. Amen. D.L. Moody tells the story of a friend who was traveling in the east, and his friend was a shepherd, and he, and he kept a custom, of, a, a custom. He called his sheep by name. That's impressive. He knew every sheep, and he called them by name. Representative of the Lord Jesus, by the way, who says, I, my sheep know me, and they follow me, and I know them. Amen? Aren't you glad Jesus knows you? And so this, this man said, well, let me put on your clothes. Let me take your crook and let me call them and see if they'll come to me like they came to you. And he did it. Mina, Mina was the words. And the whole flock ran away from him. Even though he had his clothes on, even though he had his crook, even though he had the right words, it seemed, they ran. And he said, will none of them come to me? And the shepherd said this. He said, the sick ones will. The sick ones will. I don't have to make an application there, do I? People are being mesmerized and moved to the razzle and dazzle of churches that are just empty sepulchers spiritually speaking. The doctrine may look good. The doctrine may sound good. It may feel good. Most false doctrine does feel good. And there's pleasure in sin for a season. But folks, the payoff always comes. And it's coming. It's coming. Here's the danger. This unwelcome or this unnatural growth attracts an unwelcome group. So beware of the tree that pretends, listen, hear me, that it pretends that it grew from the seed of God's word. Be, be careful. The Bible says, try the spirits and see if they're of God. Amen? Jesus says, don't be deceived by the tree that claims to have come from a mustard seed. There's only one thing that will work in your heart and mind and nothing else. What is it? It's the Word of God. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is, church. What you don't know can hurt you and ultimately destroy you. The devil doesn't want you to have a bad day. The devil wants to destroy your life. And if you're a child of God, he can't have your soul, amen, but he can destroy your testimony, and he can take your life. 
you get outside of the grace and the will of God, even as a saved person, there's, there's scripture where God says, you know what? I had to give them up so that their body might be destroyed so that their soul could be saved. That's why we follow Jesus, amen? That's why we stick close to the shepherd, amen? The wolves are coming. And I need the shepherd with his crook to crack them in the head for me, amen? Somebody says, what do you do when the devil comes knocking at the door? I don't answer it. I say, Jesus, this one's for you. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Oh, Father God, thank you so much for your word and just the practical ways that it can apply to our lives because every one of us, I know myself, there's been times that I get overly impressed with spiritual things, quote, only to find out later that it was nothing. It was wrong. It was empty. And the people that followed after it were destroyed, spiritually speaking. So God, my prayer this morning is that we would be aware of those things that can hurt us spiritually. We need to know. And in order to know that, we've got to know your word. And we need to know your word, and then we need to go out and sow your word so that others may know. And like I said, our mission for 47 years has been to get people saved, get them baptized, make them a member of the church, disciple them, teach them the word of God, teach them the plan of salvation, give them knowledge so that they can go out there and repeat the cycle so that over and over again we can see people saved out of this world so that they can go out to the world and see people saved out of this world. This is your church, God. And for 47 years, we've been preaching your word. And by your grace and mercy, God, I, I know because of what the scripture says, we're not going to have a big old crowd here. Not anymore. Oh, God, we could, we could give away things and we could put jump romper room out in the parking lot and, and we can have party time every Sunday. But, Lord, you can't out Vegas, Las Vegas. And that what gets people is what keeps people. And we, we can bring those things in here and we can bring a a group that sings, and, and that, those things are good in and of themselves. But God, we can get people to come in here, and, and, and yet as quickly as they come, they're gone. Lord, the only thing that will change a life, the only thing that will save souls, the only thing that will bring a saved soul to be a part of a thriving, Bible-preaching, Bible-believing Baptist church is the Word of God and the Son of God. So God, I'm privileged this morning just to preach your word. All glory goes to you. Lord, my prayer is that you would save anyone that's lost here, that they would escape the, the, the trap that the devil's got them in. It's not that he's going to get them. He's already got them. And he don't care what hook he hooks them on, just as long as they're trophies on his wall. God, I'd rather that they be trophies of grace to this church. They're saved, they're changed, and they're servants. God, have your will. Save the lost. And for the Christian, just remind us, we're not saved to sit. We're saved to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And if this is our church, we need to get busy serving. We need to get busy sharing and sowing the seed of the gospel. And if we're not doing that, we're not doing what you saved us to do. And so God, remind each of us, and that includes me, this pastor. Every day I, I work with people, I deal with people, and God, I want every, every person to be an opportunity to to talk about you. So God, give me holy boldness and give each of us that so that we may share our faith. Plant the seeds so that there may be a great harvest. Trophies of grace. The soul winner's crown. What a joy that would be to receive that from Christ at the judgment seat. God, have your will and your way in this invitation. All glory goes to you again in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.